Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Steve said earlier on, I've been with Skanska for just over 30 years. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to spend a great deal of that time working in London, working with some fabulous teams, delivering some excellent major projects in the city uh, and around the city fringe. I've also been fortunate enough to be part of the teams that delivered uh, 30 St Mary Acts, which you will probably know as the Gherkin, and more recently the Heron Tower. Uh, in 25 minutes, there isn't a great deal of time to talk about building tall within historic cities. So what I'm going to do is give you some examples, some specific examples uh, of the challenges we faced when we delivered Heron and Swiss Re, which is very local to here in the heart of the city. But what else I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about tall buildings over time. And it's interesting when I heard Jeff mention how he measures a tall building. Um, I don't measure a building in height or in stories. I measure a tall building in context. How tall is it with regard to the buildings that surround it? So we're going to have a little discussion about tall buildings over time. A brief romp through history, I call that. Uh, then I'm going to touch on building in complex environments. So some specific examples of the challenges we faced when we delivered Heron Tower and the Gherkin. And then we're going to have a short glimpse into the future. What does the future hold for tall buildings in London? The other thing that will probably happen this afternoon, you've had a day and a half or so of presentations, you're going to hear some things from me you've probably heard from other people. Uh, I make no apologies for that because if you hear them more than once, they're probably really important when it comes to building tall in the City of London. This is an interesting photograph. This is on the Skanska project in 1897. Uh, it's in Bradford. Uh, we, uh, we heard actually quite a lot from David earlier on about prefabrication and planning and build off site. We were building off-site and prefabricating in 1897. These uh, concrete blocks were designed by us, manufactured at our factory in Stockholm, shipped across, obviously with a just-in-time philosophy, and we ran telephone cables from Bradford to Leeds to Liverpool. Uh, so some things don't change. Yes, technological advances have been great, but some things don't change. The one thing I'm glad does change is health and safety. For those that can see the photograph, uh, this is not what we expect from our projects from a health and safety perspective, and we have recently banned top hats from our sites. So, um, I think tall is all about context. This is, for those that you recognise this, Tower of London. Uh, its real name is Her Majesty's Royal Fortress. Uh, it was built in 1078, and at the time, it was considered a tall building. 27 metres tall, and it remained the tallest building at this place in London for over 200 years. So this was considered a tall building uh, a while back. For those who recognise St Paul's Cathedral, this is the fifth cathedral that's actually stood on the site of Ludgate Hill. Uh, unfortunately, the previous four, from a combination of bad luck and fire, were destroyed. And interestingly, the, the St Paul's Cathedral that stood on the site before this, which is commonly referred to as Old St Paul's, uh, was actually closer to 150 metres tall. And the reason why St Paul's is important, um, two reasons. I'll come back to one later on, which is about sight lines. This remained the tallest building in the city of London for over 250 years. So tall is about context, and we're talking about a city, you know, a couple of thousand years or so of uh, heritage and history, and this remained the tallest building for over 250 years. So what's happened since in the city? Well, uh, this is a very small building you can see, but it's really, really important. Adelaide House, which stands on the corner of London Bridge, only, four, only 43 metres tall, but it was probably the first modern office block in the city of London. Steel frame construction, uh, central heating and ventilation, and it remained the tallest building, the tallest office block in the city for quite a while. And obviously in recent times, as well as uh, Tower 42, the Gherkin, and now the tallest building in the city, Heron Tower, in between, we've had the Stock Exchange and BP Tower, which is now called Centre Point. So as far as London is concerned, and in the context of tall, actually Heron Tower is considered tall in the city of London. But obviously what happens when we move outside of London, things change. We now have the Shard, which is, a, I think, the tallest building in Western Europe. And we have a number of other tall buildings in Europe that are either have been delivered or are in design and production. So actually, when you look in the European context, what we have in the city is not that tall. When you look on a global scale, and I do think some of Jeff's images were uh, fabulous earlier on, things start to change dramatically. There's the Burj on the right-hand side. Um, that is really tall. Will we ever build 
anything like those buildings in the city of London? I think that's a question uh, to be answered in the years to come. I said I'd come back to St Paul's and the sight lines. Uh, the, the black dot in the middle, I haven't got my pointer, is St Paul's Cathedral. Um, the idea of the sight lines, they came into effect in about the 1930s, and the idea was it to preserve the views of the dome and the spire of St Paul's Cathedral. So what you have uh, from the, anywhere in the blue area and the vantage points, you should be able to get an unhindered view of St Paul's and you can see some of the images that line up. Um, you could say that's a major challenge in building tall in the city of London. Does it restrict our growth? Does it restrict our opportunities? I think we should see it like we see all construction challenges. It's a challenge, how do we overcome it? How do we build differently? And actually, the St Paul's sight lines have affected the designs of some of our most prominent buildings in the city. If you go and have a look at Moore House on the corner of London Wall, although architecturally designed that way, it's also designed that way to maximise the views of St Paul's Cathedral. Thanks to KPF, our architects at Heron Tower, for this image. If you stand anywhere in these red areas around the city of London uh, and St Paul's is in the middle, you get a clear view of the dome and the spire. So bringing things to the current day, what are the challenges we face when building in complex, historic city centre environments? Well, in the City of London, uh, we have delivered in the last 10 years St. 30 St Mary Axe on the left, the Gherkin, and more recently Heron Tower on the right-hand side. And for those that like numbers, 30 St Mary Axe has 5,436 individual panes of glass and only one of them is curved, and we'll come back to that a bit later on. For those that are on the Heron Tower tour tomorrow, this is the uh, aquarium in the Heron Tower main reception, and you can just about gauge the size of it by seeing the two people standing behind the front desk. That's the largest private aquarium in Europe. Um, the aquarium was delivered to site in one piece. We talk about off-site prefabrication again. It weighs 100 tonnes, and we shipped it in from Colorado. That was difficult. The other difficult part was making sure that aligned with our program and painting ourselves out of the corner in reception, we had to deliver the aquarium a year in advance to complete the work around it. So what do we have to think about when we're building tall in historic environments? Well, the list is endless. Uh, you can think of your top 10 risks, your top 100 risks. There are thousands of things to think about when you're delivering tall in heritage areas. We haven't got time to talk about many of them. I'm gonna talk about three. We have to think about the things that are around us. We have to think about the most, one of the most important things we often don't talk about enough, and that's what happens down below. And then lastly, we have to think about community. Uh, we work with lots of clients, lots of developers, lots of end users, but actually when you're building in historic cities, society is our ultimate client, and we have to think about that. So, this is, the, uh, this is the junction of London Wall and Bishopsgate, not far from here. Uh, the reason I showed this location, because it's Heron Tower actually sits on the junction of these two roads. These are two of the busiest roads in the city centre during the week. Um, so, one of the key challenges is, what happens around you is how you deal with logistics. How do you deal with vehicle movement? How do you deal with people movement in an area where the traffic is, con is congested most of the time? And interestingly, there's been a quite a few slides this afternoon talking about off-site prefabrication. Uh, before we started at uh, Swiss Re, uh, the client's representative told me that if you remember one thing about tall building construction, it should be this. The key to high-rise construction is vertical transportation. Don't forget that and you'll be okay. So what we have to do is think about how we increase the amount of off-site productivity, decrease the amount of on-site productivity. So the other challenge of working at Heron Tower is we're adjacent to Liverpool Street Station. Uh, Liverpool Street Station is the second or third busiest train station in the UK. There are 55 million people a year move in and out of Liverpool Street Station. That picture's taken about six o'clock in the morning. Uh, when you get to midday, things change rapidly. Buses, traffic, people. We had hundreds of thousands of people walking past our site every week, less than a metre from this site holding. And the holding of our site is actually the boundary of our building. So they're less than a metre from the boundary of the building. This is a road that just sits alongside Heron Tower, in between Heron Tower and the Gherkin. It's a very small, congested, one-way system. That's our site on the left at Bevis Marks. 
So you're talking about logistics and vehicle movement in a, in a historic area of site that isn't made for big trucks and lorries. I like this picture. This was taken at 5 o'clock in the morning. This shows you the site, the footprint of the site at uh, Heron Tower. And as I said to you before, the footprint of the site is actually the shape and the size of the, of the building. It, it actually fits almost exactly onto the footprint of the site. There's no space for offloading. Vehicle management is difficult. Um, and to stop the problem of how do we... The, um, sorry, the primary steel columns here were 50 tonnes each. So you need a big mobile crane to move them. That's an 800 tonne mobile crane we used. Road closures are difficult in the city of London. They take weeks and weeks to plan. If there's a problem with the weather, if something goes wrong, it throws your program out entirely. So what we did, we designed a temporary work system inside the footprint of the site to allow the mobile crane to stay within the site at all times. We also did this in parallel with the top-down construction, which made life difficult at times. The difficulty with the mobile crane is that it sat in this position most of the time about half a metre above a Victorian service duct that took high power cables, high voltage cables and fibre optic cables. Half a metre below the surface of where that crane sat. As we've said previously, and it tends to be the theme of the day, off-site prefabrication is everything. We prefabricated at Heron Tower all the m and &E modules, all the m and &E primary risers, and actually, interestingly, all the staircases, uh, due to restrictions on some of our deliveries, we delivered a section of the staircase every Sunday, lifted it into place, fixed it into place, the following week did so again. We shouldn't forget what goes on underground. Very, very important. Uh, when we talk about digging in the city of London, we always talk about digging deep, but not too deep. The reason for that is we have 2,000 years of... Um, underground obstructions to deal with. This is a, a very old map, circa 1300 of the City of London. Uh, the beige line moving from left to right is the old London Wall. Just above that is the Houndsditch, and in the square is where we built Heron Tower, and in the circle is where we built the Gherkin. This is the, uh, the pile cap at Swiss Re. Uh, the reason this is important is because after all the archaeology, when it came to pouring the, the pile cap, uh, we decided to do this in one continuous pour. That's a 30 metre diameter footprint. Uh, the slab was about three metres deep. We poured just over 2,000 cubic metres of concrete in a day. Uh, we had 450 vehicle movements in a 15 hour period. That takes planning, that takes communication, that takes the police, that takes the Corporation of London, local businesses, the local residents, that's what it takes to build big, complex buildings in a city centre environment. What else is underground? Well, of course, we have the tube lines. We have the central line, the Met, the district, sorry, the circle. Um, for the technical amongst you, this is for purely for illustrative purposes. Uh, telephone lines, power cables, Victorian sewers, Victorian mains, in a moment, hopefully, you'll see a tube line. Archaeology, unexploded bombs. Three tube lines below uh, Heron Tower. The trick is when you're building underground is find everything that's underground and then try and miss it or work your way around it. The other thing you don't see on here is the secret tunnels. There are a number of secret tunnels that run under the city centre and clearly I'm not allowed to show you the secret tunnels. But that's what you have to deal with. There's even a mail train that runs under uh, Heron Tower and Swiss Re. So when we, th we, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about what goes on above, we have to spend, as delivery uh, contractors, thinking about what goes on below. I said I'd come back to the Houndsditch, and, and that's for archaeological reasons. Um, the Houndsditch gets its name. It's a hound's ditch. It sits right next to the London Wall. In Roman times, they used to throw all the dogs over the wall into a ditch, dead dogs, into a ditch. Uh, we found the remains of three dogs during our excavations. And, and archaeology also played a big part in the construction of uh, the gherkin. We found the remains, 15, 1600 year old remains of a teenage Roman girl. Uh, we gave them to the Museum of London. They were on display for 12 years. And at the end of the construction of 30 St. Mary Axe, we took the remains buried them back alongside the site and laid a plaque 
and had a ceremony at the local church. That is what history and heritage is all about. Community, for those eagle-eyed amongst you, that's Adelaide House in the background, the first office block in the city of London. Uh, community is our ultimate client. Uh, alongside 30 St Mary Acts, we had two working churches, St Helens and St Andrews in the Undercroft. We have to appreciate service times. We have to appreciate the fact that these are two churches that survived the Great Fire of London and survived the World War II Blitz. Uh, we don't want to do anything to damage that part of London's heritage. I said I'd come back to the curved piece of glass at the uh, Gherkin. This is it. That's the only curved piece of glass in the entire building. It's the one at the top. From a community perspective, we spend a great deal of time thinking about what happens to the health and safety of our people on the site. We also have to spend as much time thinking about the health and safety of the public around us. If you drop a bolt from 200 metres, uh, it hits the ground at about 140 miles an hour. If you drop a hammer from 200 metres, it hits the ground slightly quicker. You cannot afford to take any chances when you're building high-rise in congested city centre sites. For those that attended the top of the Gherkin reception the other day, this is what it looked like before it was finished. Uh, we prefabricated all the sections above and put them together like an orange peel at the top of the building. Eight sections lifted to site, fixed together, two weeks, done. And that was prefabrication ten years ago. Heron Tower, from a health and safety perspective, is good as we've ever got. Uh, we lost 88 man hours due to health and safety incidents, and that you could argue that's 88 hours too much. We spent nearly three and a half million man hours on the site. And you do that by working alongside the health and safety executive, alongside the clients, alongside the community, and understanding and making sure health and safety is top of the agenda. So wrapping up, what does the future look like? Well, before we look too far into the future, I think we should just take a look back at the past of the City of London, because this is really important. Uh, 2,000 years ago, the population of the City of London, and it's the black dot in the middle, was less than 20,000. You had the old Roman wall around the outside of the city. Flash forward, you know, 600 years or so, medieval and Tudor London. City centre growth wasn't that rapid, but the population increased to about 350,000 or so. And during this period, obviously, was when we built the Tower of London and St Paul's Cathedral. Flash forward to Stuart London. That's the first time London expanded outside the city. At this point, population increased to about half a million. During the 18th century, that's the early Industrial Revolution, um, city started to grow out. London expanded. Population at this time was about a million. What happens next is rather dramatic. In a hundred years, the population of London increased from a million to six and a half million. During this period, it became the biggest city in the world. And shortly afterwards, that's what London looks like in the 20th century. So when we talk about tall buildings, you know, is tall buildings the way forward? Are tall buildings the way forward? Is the only way up? We are running out of space. And when you consider the statistic that says 80% of all the buildings that stand today will still be standing in 2050. Where are we going to build everything? The other statistic says that we need to build as much in the next 40 years as we have in the last 400 to accommodate population growth. Where are we going to build everything? If the only way isn't up, then where is it? 50% of the world's population live in urban environments. Uh, by 2030, that's going to increase to 60%. Energy demand will increase by 50% by the year 2030. How are we going to accommodate all of this if we don't do something different, if we don't think about tall and we don't think about tall in the right context? So these are the things we have to think about in the future. Again, the list is endless. You can pick on anything, whole life costing, recycling, population growth, the environment. In the current economic climate, in the current economic climate is the environment really important to developers and tenants? Is it really important to the government at the moment? I think they're questions that need answering at some point. Existing buildings and reusing existing buildings may be the way forward. This is the Empire State Building, obviously, in New York. Our office is on that green band on the 32nd floor. That's where we sit. Uh, we've made that floor lead platinum. Uh, it took a lot of time and a lot of effort, but it can be done. Can you do that on a larger scale? Should we be doing more of that? I think there's food for thought. 
My final couple of slides. This is one of my favourite buildings around town. Um, it's the monument down by London Bridge. It cost just over £13,000 to build in 1677. And at the time it was considered tall. So in Jeff's view, this is not a very, very tall building at all. If you were standing there in 1677, this is the tallest thing you've ever seen. It's 202 feet high. And the reason it's 202 feet high is if you lay it down on its side, the tip at the top touches the point at which the Great Fire of London started a few years before that. So back in 1677, this was a really, really tall building. I think it's still the largest independent column in the world. If you look at the pictures today, it's slightly different because this is what the monument looks like today. So tall is really all about context uh, for me. And it's about the surroundings and it's about how others view. Everyone has a different view of tall. My last slide is this one. I'm going to take you back to where we started, the Tower of London. This is an etching from 500 years ago. Uh, as I said to you, back in, back in 1078, this was a very, very tall building. If you stood here today and took a photograph, and I don't have one, that skyline would look radically different today. For a start, you'd see the gherkin just behind it. So I think when we're thinking about tall in the historical context, for me, there's three things to think about. The future is definitely tall. The past is really, really important, but context is everything. Thank you very much.